Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the show. If you are new here, this is the Cut It Out podcast, and I am your host, the Red Wizard. This is a collage and papercraft chat show. Uh, I chat with my favorite artists from all around the globe. Today's guest is David Crunel. David is a hand-cut collage artist based in Brussels. If you haven't seen his intricate geometric collages, they're wild, they're awesome, and we're certainly going to be looking at a few during the show. Now for the shameless plug. If you like the show, please like and subscribe. If you already make collages, you could visit my Amazon affiliate store on my website. When you buy a pair of scissors, Jeff Bezos will throw a quarter at my skull. If you don't collage, I have free collage kits available on my website that you could print at home and start cutting up. Also, if you need gifts for this holiday season, I sell prints and other merchandise uh, as well, all at redwizardcollage.com. There will be a link in the show notes. All right. I'm so excited to have David here, and let's get this conversation started. Hey, David. Hey, Jude. Hey, uh, so thanks for being here. I know it's super late over there right now. What time is it over there? It's uh, it's just midnight, but uh, th thanks for welcoming me. I'm very happy to be on the show. So over the summer, you and I were in the same show at Revolution Gallery in Buffalo. I live in Buffalo, so it's like a 10 minute drive from my house, but you live in Brussels. How do you connect with Revolution Gallery? Um, well, yeah, it, it, it was fun. They, they contacted me. I, I get contacted uh, relatively frequently by by people in the U.S., uh, small galleries and, uh, you know, this, this type of cultural places, just like the Revolution Gallery, which is really cool. Um, I usually don't really follow up on that very much, but I have friends in, in Buffalo. I was there um, about three years ago. And so I just knew a little bit the place. I didn't know the gallery, but I, I, I knew exactly where it was. And I had some friends um, living there. So I said, okay, why not? Maybe I can, I can ship a few artwork for this small exhibition. Um, the main motivation was to show the, the work, the, you know, real artwork to my friends living there. Uh, and the Revolution Gallery seems, seems cool. They were cool people and uh, it was interesting. So. Um, yeah, I did it, and uh, it turned out to be the one of the artworks turned out to become the 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 main visual for the exhibition. That was pretty fun uh, to watch. I, I discovered that really uh, very late uh, at the later stage. They didn't tell me anything. I just found the poster, and that was fun. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, um, there was was it like a uh, was a collage of the Virgin Mary or something like that? Was that it? It was it was a, a mix of um, like a. 3D lenticular of, of Jesus mixed with um, Johannes Bosch paintings, uh, very, very, you know, the geometrical cutouts on it. And uh, the, the gallery owner um, told me that someone came to the gallery and started to make some kind of, of a fuss about it, saying that it was blasphemous and that it had to be taken down from the exhibition. And uh, he came back the day after with a with a note that he put on the, the lamppost uh, in the streets asking the, the gallery to remove the poster, to remove the artwork because it was outrageous and that everybody should call and, and ask for that. And, <laughs> uh, and, and the, gallery, the gallery owner told me they laughed about it. I mean, they, they, they listened to the guy, of course, and his complaint uh, very respectfully, but they said, no, we're not going to take it down. Um, and uh, after two weeks or three weeks, they didn't have uh, any any remark or phone call or anyone else asking to take it down. So it was it was a fun experience for them. So um, so sorry, it sounds like you're doing it. something right. You're you're evoking an emotional response on some level. That's that's pretty good. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, of course, as, as soon as you start playing with religious uh, iconography, yeah, you can trigger that kind of reaction. That's that's part of what I like as well. Uh, it, it, the idea is not to be provocative for the sake of being provocative. There's always a message behind. And that was just fun. I was not expecting that. So, yeah, that was cool. Yeah, I think with collage, the power of it, especially for anyone learning how to make artwork, is like you're going to make artwork with powerful symbols, things that already have meaning, right? Yeah. So you're playing with 
powerful things, you know, when you use uh, religious imagery or anything for that matter, you know, it, it could have pissed somebody off if it was a picture of Mickey Mouse. You never know what's going to make yeah. someone upset. Yeah, you could get sued by Disney if you use Mickey Mouse. Uh, don't don't play with that. Uh, that's you, true. You, you, yeah. you risk less if you play with Jesus uh, images than, than Mickey Mouse or, or Marvel stuff. So, yeah, don't do that. But you're yeah, right. right. It's, uh, it's sticking both. with the pictures, then, then uh, you might be safer with Jesus than, uh, than Mickey Mouse. That's true. Definitely, definitely, yeah. How'd you make friends in Buffalo? Uh, well, uh, I can explain that. Um, basically, I'm part of a cult. Um, it's a it's a music cult. I'm, I'm a huge huge fan of the band Guided by Voices. Okay. And, uh, and Robert Pollard. Maybe you know the band. I mean, they quite. They quite I've heard the, I've heard the name. Yeah. And um, so yeah, you know, when you're a music fan, so at some point in your life, you can just fall into the pit of becoming extremely extremely fan of, of an artist or or a band. Um, and that happened to me when I was 16 and. I've been an avid collector of the of the of the band, and yeah, uh, I have friends all around the world because we're all part of this community. I say it's a cult because some of them are really hardcore, deep into this fandom attitude. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, I I know um, hundreds of of fans of this band uh, since now more than twenty years. Nice. Um, all around the world, really. Um, so, yeah, I, it happens that I have a few of them in Buffalo. So when I was there, I, I hang out with them. Um, so these are really good friends that I have really since a long time. So it was fun to have a, a, pretty much every, everywhere I go in the U.S., I have someone that I know since a while uh, from message board or from trading bootlegs uh, of Guided by Voices. Or Yeah, it's, it's a big community. It's like... A, Let's say uh, vanilla uh, social media, kind of. We just mm -hmm. know each other since so long, uh, but it's the same type of, of connection that we have. And yeah, every time every time someone's in Brussels, uh, I'm happy to see them. And every time I'm in the US, whatever the city, I always find someone that I know. I'm a Grateful Dad and a fish fan, so I know all about you know trading yeah, yeah, things and yeah. stuff like that, and having friends to crash in Boston and you know New York, different different towns, and yeah. it's a good time, man. It's the same idea, yeah. It's a it's a very strong connection uh, that you have. We don't we don't we don't need to talk politics or have the same ideas uh, or, or be spiritual together. We just have this connection. It's very strong, and um, yeah, for more than twenty years, I'm, I'm dealing with these people, and I really love a lot of them. That's um, awesome. That's really cool. Well, since we were talking about your poster, I realized that was from your elect electrum electrum series, right? Electrum, yeah. So I pulled up. A visual example here for those that are just listening um actually why don't you uh, you, you can go ahead and uh, explain what we're looking at here for for a quick second so yeah the, the electron series is something I, I i developed um it took me about a year to collect all the material and uh, a few weeks to to do the execution of everything uh, the idea is to mix um these iconographies and visuals uh, very strong you use the term kitsch uh, because they are like you know extremely saturated extremely um, exaggerated like you have super caucasian virgin mary and blonde jesus and but these are the images that you, you can find in some shops um, that are sold like totally uh, you know without without any humor behind but we, we kind of look at them as, okay, they, they, are, they seem a bit ridiculous. And when the idea was to mix this imagery of uh, politics, religion, and um, and some other, uh, let's say, propagandist uh, message, mm -hmm. the idea was to mix that in order to create something visually interesting. So individually, the images uh, are kind of gimmicky and, and funny and slight, almost ridiculous, uh, but when when they are mixed like that in very complex geometric patterns, uh, you are just pleased visually by, by the appeal of it. So it's really a mix of these various gods bit together. Um, mm -hmm. And basically the title, Electrum, the Electrum is the, the mix of gold and silver. And oh. it, it used to be something created uh, in, in, the, in the antiquity because uh, that was uh, a way to obtain something as shiny as gold, but that was less valuable because there was silver in it. 
So this is like an alchemical process? Yeah, I can even simpler than that. If you, you can just melt gold and silver and you mix them and you obtain something that looks like gold, but the value is lower because it's full of silver. Oh. And that's why this, this, this metal was not this alloy uh, was never more popular. It's because you could not give a value to it. But when you look at it, it really looks like gold. So the electrum, this will, this is the, the alloy of gold and silver, um, is a mix of two valuable elements to create something that looks even more valuable, but it's not. The idea behind that was really the same. Uh, you take these imageries, this very um, kind of ridiculous uh, type of iconographies, you mix them in, a, you know, in order to obtain something that is visually pleasant, but has no real value in terms of message uh, behind. Yeah, there's, um, they're, they're beautiful pictures in their own right. You know, I, when I think of your source material, I think of going to flea markets, um, you know, places where, uh, like, in like an Indian food store where people buy their spices and stuff like that. There's pictures of Krishna, and depending on where you go, what religion or piss from the world people are from, they have their vibrant uh, pictures of the Caucasian Mary or Jesus or, um, you know, the, the bright glowing Krishna and stuff. And so, your geometries. Is that kind of a nod to um, like this old science or this uh, this this process of um, I don't know? Could you explain yeah. why? Because I wanted to ask you about your 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 geometric stuff. Um, it's really awesome. These cuts are very straight. They look like they take a, uh, a yeah, super they, look, they look like laser, but no, no, they are they are all, they're all uh, uh, cut by hand. The, that's the idea. The idea is to have, uh, so all this imagery, uh, of course, totally, uh, it's fiction. It's really drawings, extremely detailed and paintings. And then if you just cut them in very striking and straight lines and very uh, precise geometrical aspect, you kind of go the, the other way because there's, there's supposed to be drawings and paintings of imagery or dreamy aspect of, um, you know, uh, mythology and, and religion. So applying regularity and, and you know, a pattern that is very precise and, and strict, almost hard in, 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 this, in, in the composition, um, that creates a dissonance between the super flashy aspect and the super saturated uh, visual with something, uh, with, with a pattern that's very uh, cold, that could almost look like um, metal blades. It's, it's really to create a dissonance. Also, in, I'm not very precise myself. I'm not uh, very uh, patient at all. Uh, so the challenge of making something neat, uh, clean, you know, clean cuts, uh, complex patterns and complex shapes, uh, that's kind of a challenge to me. And that, that's what was attracting me in addition to this dissonance that I wanted to create. Sure. And speaking of, of patience, something that comes up in the show uh, almost every show that I, I never planned on was the, the act of collecting things. So for source material, you said that it took about a year um, to collect these things. Was this just kind of like a, a slow drip process where you would, you know, find a Jesus, find a Krishna, find a Mao um, and slowly That's, do it? Or can you walk us through that a little bit? I, I, I know I'm, I'm not really like uh, most colleges, you know, they like to go into thrift stores and into uh, uh, bookstores to, to dig into into the, the stock and play on the luck to find something. Um, um, I like the romantic idea of that, but I don't do that at all. Mm -hmm. I, um, I I just buy the stuff I need. I buy books that I know uh, that I know well. I know the content. I know what images I, I will find um, because I don't I don't play with luck and I don't play with uh, hazard. Uh, I know what, I know what I want. I know what I need. So when I say it took me a year, it's, it's because um, to to find these the posters that you were mentioning about you know Indian food stores and stuff. These are exactly where to find them, except that if you want to find them at the bigger size, it's extremely difficult. Um, it's not really imported here. So basically, I need to work with uh, manufacturers uh, in China or in India mm -hmm. to collect them. Uh, in order to to order them, and then it takes like three, four months to to receive a, an answer or to to uh, to receive an order. 
I have custom issues. I have, yeah, it's, it's more of a, yeah. you know, trading process more than a, a classic collage collector or researcher sure. process. Sure. Yeah. And it's not like an iPhone. There's not, people are not prioritizing sending you a holographic no, Mao exactly. Zedong or, you know, whatever. Okay. <laughs> Especially a big site. You can, you can find easily like lenticulars of postcards uh, pretty much in, in any city uh, nowadays. It's a very uh, common, common thing to find in any museum shop. You can find that. But if you want uh, like a, uh, like a, B, a B2 or a B1 size poster lenticular, this is, uh, we're talking about something different here. It's really, really complex to, to, to gather, especially if you want a nice one. Uh, also, in one of my last trip to in order to buy stuff was um, in March last year. I was in the Vatican uh, in Italy just to uh, to buy posters uh, of religious iconographies um, at the at the bigger size, and it was just uh, during the outbreak. So uh, I was stuck in in Rome for for two days because of that. Uh, all the flights were cancelled, and that was the last time. I really traveled for, for, for that, but yeah, it took me a year to gather because I have to order from manufacturing, uh, from manufacturers uh, in, in, in India, in China. And when I try to, I have to travel to buy stuff myself, uh, but I know usually where I, have, where I buy the stuff. I, I don't, I don't play with luck at all. So maybe there is magic in the hologram clutching, clutching a Jesus hologram might've saved you from the COVID. Definitely. Uh, yeah. I haven't got infected. So, yeah. And I, I finally got, I finally found my way back home after two days uh, uh, trying to find a flight. But yeah. So, everyone listening, when you come across a poster size hologram, ship it to me. Think of David, send him an email. So, you like ones that are like, what about about this big? You like the bigger oh, ones, right? Uh, bigger than that. Um, uh, I can show you, like, is it this, uh, that big? No. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's big. big. That's like, uh, yeah, it's 50, I mean, 50 centimeters by 70. So I think it's um, something like 24 by 30 inches, something like that. Okay. So okay. yeah, that's, that's quite difficult to find. Yeah, those are big. Yeah. Um, so one th another thing that comes up often is what we glue, what people glue with and what they cut with. What do you, I've never heard of anyone cutting through hologram. What do you like to cut through your holograms with? Yeah. Um, Please don't do that. It, it's it's painful. It's horrible. It's a it, it's a nightmare. Um, just imagine cutting with a with a classic cutter, um, one millimeter of plastic, and then you have to do like two hundred cuts for this one small piece. It takes time. It takes it takes sweat and and blood, and yeah, it's very painful. So it's, it's do things cut. pop out at you when you do that. Do you get things like flying through the air. No, it's, it's not. It's I, ha I have a process in order to minimize the effort or to like concentrate the effort. Let's say mm -hmm. um, so. I cut everything on you know in one way, then the other, then uh, third way and fourth way, and more or less after that, I can start popping out the the elements. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it requires a lot of a lot of strength, a lot of blades. Um, yeah, it's, it's don't do that. It's very painful. Uh, I don't recommend doing that, but that's part of the process. I, I know you can you can use some laser uh, cutting, but um, it takes a lot of time if you do that as well. And also, it burns the plastic. Uh, mm -hmm. The lenticular is a, is, is a paper sheet um, with uh, with the, the plastic sheet on top. So cutting that with a with laser is not is not easy either. But that's part of the challenge. Again, it's I like I like the I like the challenge in that. Yeah, I think. I think people's eyes pick up on like the the handiwork of it all too. I think when um once you get into laser like laser cutting and stuff, which definitely has its own merit and it's an awesome thing to use, but it's something different. Yeah, yeah. it's it's uh you know, there's a machine doing the work for you. So yeah. Um it, it's a I, I don't want to 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 start the debate, but it's just like you know, digital collage is is digital collage a collage, or it's Photoshop, or is it graphic design? So, no, when you when you do it by your, with your own hands, uh, it has a different value, uh, at least to me. Um, I understand you can do great things with laser cutting, but it's a different process. So, I'm happy to talk to you this week about geometric things and um, small cutting. 
I've been, uh, I finally have been studying an artist, the life and works, writings of an artist that really inspired me. Um, and I do not know why I cannot think of her name right now. This is ridiculous. Hold on. Bridget Riley. Sorry. Yeah, Bridget yeah. Riley. I'm already on page 123 and I forgot the name. Oh. Right. Um, <laughs> so uh, Bridget Riley, you've probably seen her work. She's a famous uh, op artist. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, I see. And um, yeah. isn't that the kind of stuff you you, you place like a, a plastic a PVC pattern on top, and when you move it, it looks like it's uh, animated. There, yeah, there is stuff that looks very similar, but this is like this is fine art stuff. Yeah, that came about in the '60s. She's popular in here in Buffalo because some of her work is in the Albright Knox in the main collection. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a more, look for a more famous piece, but um, it's very interesting in this book. Actually, here's a picture of her. This is the reason I bought this book was because there's, yeah. she was a painter, but she used collage as a process to yeah. basically make little like charrettes, little like um, sketches yeah. to look at the color interactions of the pieces before she, uh, she would make the painting. So she would make a little mock-up of these pieces and then she would make yeah. these, these yeah. big paintings. And what starts to happen is your eye just dances around the paper. So she's basically messing with the way that your eyeballs work. Um, you have an awesome series uh, on your website called the Intarsia. It's full of what looks like hundreds, if not thousands of small diagonal cuts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm glad you glad you appreciate it. It was um, a series uh, I wanted to make since quite a while. Uh, I am I am quite passionate about um, about uh, quilting, American quilting, and you know folk folk art. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wanted to I digested a lot of that uh, for a couple of years before daring to to work on that. Um, the idea was to to use these patterns uh, using the the diamond shape that was used for for a lot of quilting. So the quilting from from the U.S. Um, you know, 18th century, uh, 19th century, early 19th century, um, it was it was most of the time made by a woman and you know uh, housewives, and they were like sewing uh, this pieces of cloth, like patchwork, and in, in very interesting patterns and complex geometric styles that I find fascinating. The thing is that, of course, because it was made by, by a woman, uh, it was not considered as art. It was considered as, uh, you know, craft or uh, you know, time hmm. waste. Oh, if, if, if it was made by a man, the same one, well, then that's, that is art. Uh, embroidery was the same, you know, uh, uh, or you know, even painting, like, in the in the in the Middle Age, uh, embroidery was was a technique considered as art if it was made by by men and as a as a time waster by women. So I like I like the idea to to talk about the, that during my series about uh, about the quilting. I, I do use uh, I always have a ton a ton of books um, that that type of stuff. Uh, my guys nice. quilt, and inside you do have you know, examples and patterns that I've been using quite a lot and have been studying um, that kind of, I don't know if you see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah why don't you show it again? I just moved that yep. uh, picture so out. That's one that I found recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see, you can see. The, uh, I've been working on a new piece like here behind me there. Uh, mm -hmm. That is using that the same type of, uh, same process for quilting. Mm -hmm. so, you know, when you when you use this type of books as inspiration, um, it's just a goldmine for me to to you know have my brain yeah. filled with examples and precise ways of working and creating the these patterns. 
So for this series, for the industrial series, I wanted to to focus on that. So and he did. It's thousands of pieces most of the time. Um, again, the geometric aspect being quite quite a challenge. I, I like. I'm, again, I'm not precise. I'm not patient, and uh, that was quite a challenge. Some of the patterns that 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 were used in the um, in the series were actually coming from quilts uh, made made by soldiers during the civil war. Um, that were mostly like, you know, exercises. They were just showing off these skills, basically. But mm -hmm. the patterns were really interesting, and and I wanted to to use some of them um, and putting some other other type of co of content uh, in it. Do you know were were quilts sometimes made from found things? Were they almost collages in their own way? I would think yeah, yeah. in eighteen hundreds, people probably collage with all sorts of old shirts and blankets and stuff exactly exactly it, it was exactly that like they were um you know using stuff that were unused uh when when you dig in a bookstore to find an old book or an old magazine to create something new uh they were doing the same but with, with the with the fabrics that they were that mm. they were flying around i do i do i've, I've acquired uh, two years ago um a quilt from uh, from the, the early 19th century, uh, from the uh, from the Brooklyn area, and it's a charm quilt. So every piece used in the in the, in the big quilt comes from a different fabric, and wow. that's because they had so much to use, uh, and they could not like make you know the, they didn't have enough. You just imagine you have this one uh, National Geographic with this one good image, and you would like to have something similar, but no, you can't because you only have this one type of image. They were they were doing the same, but with fabric. And I found that fascinating how creative they were, and how interested they were in the um, in the pattern and in the in the in the graphics that they were that were used in these, mm -hmm. uh, in these fabrics two centuries ago. It's fascinating how how creative they were. And those books, from the what I've glanced at, is they literally have instructions how to make. I don't know, a three inch by three inch square, which yeah. doesn't look like much, but when you start adding them all together, almost like a tessellation, you get a complicated looking. That is, um, that is exactly the, the point. Well, yeah. Look, look at that. This, this looks like something relatively basic, let's say, but mm -hmm. you learn all of, the, all of them. And when you manage to, um, to use them well, this is what you obtain, you see? So it's really like learning a pattern of one shape and then you are free to go with, uh, you know, you, you've learned 10 shapes, then you can go and start building your own stuff. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really- uh, So many of the things that we use as tools for collage um, are also used by quilters, right? Like um, the source material the, is, is the yeah, same idea. The cutting mats, a lot of the Ulfa products, a lot of people like to cut, you know, with those. Um, I think when I recently was interviewed interviewed by Ulfa um, for their website, and the only person that I knew would give a damn was my brother in law's mom from pennsylvania where i think cool things pretty big there because of the whole like amish like dutch thing exactly, exactly. They have a big community. she she does so many quilts that she gives them away to like children's hospitals and stuff like yeah. that um they're awesome so yeah she's the only one who was like oh you're talking to Alpha? that's so cool that's yeah so cool. one per one person cared it was great <laughs> uh, i i care too no, that's a, but again yeah you you're you're right it's uh the, the, the quilting is also about, I mean, she's right. The, the, the idea of the quilting is also, um, it's used as a gift. People were giving away that with like making quilts as a gift for, for other households. And um, there's, a, there's a, a sharing process that you can also find in some collage communities where people are trading artworks um, and they're trading materials. You, you, do, have, you do share, um, you know, kits for, for collage. All, mm. all, all this part of like giving back to community or, or trading or sharing um, is definitely part of the of the idea of the, the quilters at some point. They were making quilts as a gift or uh, as a present for, for random occasion. Yeah, trading, trading source materials uh, is a lot of fun. And 
sometimes now, even with my uh, podcast guests, I, I'll see stuff that I know I don't have any interest in using and I set it aside, eventually fill up an envelope and, and send it off. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, um, Goofcraft, Alex Dorney was on the show and he loves making big giant robots out of old like you know i'll see like a life magazine there'll be a, a blown up picture of like a ballpoint pen this big and i'm like oh man i gotta save that for alex now speaking of collecting you you mentioned a moment ago that you purchased like a, a 200 a 200 year old uh quilt you're a, you're a fine art collector what do you collect that, that's that's um yeah, I try not to actually. Um, I, I'm fighting. I, I'm a member of the of the Folk Art Museum uh, in New York since a few years, um, and I'm, I receive you know the uh, art and antiques from the U.S. Um, magazine every three months, and I, I'm always afraid to to open it because I just want to to, to acquire more stuff and to buy fine art. I, I really try not to. I'm I'm limiting myself a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't buy too much fine art. I have, uh, I took, took my time to, to buy the right quilt that I wanted. It was quite an investment, uh, that I don't regret at all. Of course, it's, uh, that, that's part of the joy of, of purchasing art. But, um, I do, I do also collect art myself. I, I, I have this philosophy, um, it's very personal, uh, but I invite everyone to share it. Um, every time I sell something, I buy something. Because I think the, I like the idea that, that money stays between artists. Um, every time I, I sell something or have a big show, um, I always dedicate a portion of the sales of the revenues to, to acquire something uh, that I like. I don't I just, I just don't like send money like that. I just buy stuff that I that I admire, not that I want to, as an investment. I just buy stuff, mm -hmm. and I buy stuff that I want on my walls. I I, I would love to buy bigger artworks and bigger stuff but if it's to keep it stored somewhere that's not interesting i buy stuff that i know i can put on the wall uh so yeah my place is quite covered all, by all of this uh, i like that notion and something that i was thinking about this week is i could be wrong i haven't read a single book about this but to me artists were the first ones to lose their jobs from uh like automation so now, like a few years ago, a lot of cab drivers lost their jobs to Uber. And yeah. like, we understand that. But yeah. artists and craftsmen, as soon as they started pumping out baskets and garbage cans, I don't, it, pretty much anything you could buy in the floor of like a Target or, or whatever, that's not produce or like a, a machine, artists and craftsmen used to make that. Yeah. yeah. So we were the first ones who way at the time of modernity around the turn of the, the century we lost our gig and more or less one of my favorite um art documentaries is called shock of the new yeah and it's about basically the creation of of modern art and i'm going to totally paraphrase probably five hours of bbc uh footage okay. but um more or less once the something like the camera came about there was no point in painting people the way that they actually looked because you could go to the department store you could hire a photographer yeah, and yeah. they would take the picture so all of a sudden you have this tradition of painting where everyone's like well what are we going to show yeah and so yeah yeah uh, I, of... I, I, that's interesting because you you talk about about um art and, and artists as a, as a job, it used to be a job. It used to be a career. It used to be, um, let's say, a, a, a career choice. Yeah, you, we, we, especially in Europe, you know, you can you you could decide to be an artist at some point, and you would study that, and you would be one because there would be work for you as an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, that that definitely disappeared because um, the knowledge, the craft, the material became available for everyone and uh so yeah that, that, that kind of diluted the value my my opinion is that um artists as, as after that after after this first wave of uh, of change 
uh, of changes. The I, I think artists now have more to say, and uh, everybody can take a, can can take photos with the photo with, with the camera. But can you say something? Can you pass a message? Can you deliver something in addition to just uh, showing something? So that that's what makes, to, in my definition, dif the difference between uh, artists and you know, uh, visual people or, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of mm -hmm. blurry a definition and I don't want to, to bother people with that, but yeah, it's kind of like, uh, sometimes it's, it's a bit easy. It's easier now to be an artist, but it's difficult to say things, uh, that will create art by itself. One thing I know I always, uh, struggle with is to me, like every, every art form has its own, own limitations. Um, the one thing about art is it ultimately it, if we do like a, ultimately a lot of art can just become decoration decor right there's a market for that yeah there's a market for that but at the same time it's like on the very far end of necessity yeah. you know um like i used to be a, a landscape designer a garden designer and i live in a you know buffalo is a very like blue collar town i studied in miami where people just hire people to take care of their orchids and all their stuff to look beautiful. That's not the market here. And with fine art, I think the thing that always bothers me about it is like, it could sometimes just sits on the wall or is just a uh, decoration. So one thing I've been like interested in lately while like making my own merchandise, you know, silly things like you no know, t-shirts and um, stuff like that is the, book or like smaller things that people can collect for like a lower price you know like a, a comic or a zine or like a catalog costs a lot less than a, you know 18th 18th uh 1800s quote from the 1800s stuff like that now i noticed on your website that you create extensive collages for or i'm sorry extensive catalogs for each of your series of of, of works yeah. um can you tell us why you do that? Um, it seems like a really interesting process, but it also seems like a ton of work. Um, well, for, first thing first, no, it's not a, it's not a lot of work uh, because it's easy for me to, to make that. So I don't see that as, I, I see that as work, but making art to me is work. It's not like um, a fun process uh, that uh, I'm, I'm enjoying a lot. It's, it's work. And making these catalogs is is a process, and I'm very very um, uh, confident in it. It just goes really fast for me to make that, so it doesn't require much effort. Um, doesn't take too much time. But why I do it is because um, you know my generation is still based on, on paper, and as as long as it, you know, not everything is digital. I like to have a catalog at an exhibition. Um, you know, I, I like the idea to, to have these catalogs and to be able to, to distribute them um, because like that they exist. I, I, I still have this feeling that when it, um, uh, whatever happens to, to, to the artworks that I make, the catalogs will always be there to testify that there was a trace at some point and that existed. Uh, I, li I like that idea. Also, my, my artwork is quite pricey. Um, you know, there's a market behind, so you know, just, it makes me, it's a bit embarrassing for me to see the, the prices that it can reach. Um, so I like to just give away the catalogs because, uh, yeah, people who come, I, I'm the same. When I go to an exhibition, of course, I would like to acquire something. It's too expensive. I'm frustrated by it. And I can have like deep thoughts about it. I think it's unfair and I wish I could be richer or whatever. That's why I like to give away the, the catalogs. Uh, I try to make them nice but I give them for free because yeah, that's, that's part of the, that's part of the, the things I like to share. Um, right. I like the idea that, okay, you can, people cannot buy art because it's expensive, but they, they can have something that, that they like if they want. I, I put them, I put some on sale on, on the website because uh, I do receive requests uh, from abroad and usually that only pays for the production. Uh, I don't make any benefit out of that. Um, and usually it's made to pay for the people who can't really afford it. So when the, when I have a run of catalogs, when I have like four, 400 or 500 
catalogs. I always try to give some to schools or art students because, yeah, they can't really buy that. So I'm, I'm happy to share that. That's part of the process. I like to, to give away stuff. I'm seeing a connection where you say that when you earlier in the show, you said that when you sell something, you like to buy something. So I don't know how your brain works, but for me, it sounds like you know that you're going to sell a piece. You know, I don't know. I don't know how much your, your work sells for. Um, you, you sell a piece and you're like, all right, well, if I sell 10 pieces, I could allocate like, you know, one of these, some of the money towards buying a whole bunch of these catalogs. Is, is that kind of where your head's at? It's, it's more, I anticipate, I anticipate all, all the cost for the catalogs. Uh, like, um, let's say I have, for instance, um, this, this catalog is for the, the Electrum series. It's mm -hmm. a, it's quite fat, big fat catalog, full full of very flashy imagery. I think there are sixty or seventy four pages. I don't remember. And it's a you know high quality product, uh, soft touch cover, like really like the idea is to give like something that looks more like a book. Um, I mean that has to probably cost at least eight ten dollars just to print one of those. I would think. Yeah, more. Well, of course, I I know tricks to reduce the production cost, um, but. Yeah, it's it's we we around seven eight dollars uh, a piece, mm -hmm. and of course I print like um, I think there were like four hundreds of them. Wow! Um, I anticipate the cost because I know I will, I will get I will get the money back at some point, and I don't really, really focus on that too much. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a hundred of them were distributed the day of the um, virtual exhibition uh, that we made for that. That's just part of the fun. Uh, also, this one, this one is, is even more like in 2016, I had this exhibition called Fog. Mm -hmm. And the catalog was actually um, a broadsheet newspaper mm -hmm. that people could take in the street. Uh, so, yeah, that was a very fun type of sure. nice material to distribute. And it was handed over in the street. Um, that's the best advertising. I prefer that. Than, than paying Facebook ads or, or whatever. It's like, let's, let's give stuff for free to people. People like it. So I'll show you one thing I'm working on right now. One yep. second. This past, this past uh, two or three weeks has been real exciting for me because I'm, I'm figuring out, I'm having this aha moment where I realized when I was younger how much a, influence comic books had on me and i had i had no idea and when i started making zines i was going to comic book shops and i was like holy crap i love this stuff and i'm looking at old comics so um inside one of the comics i found this old advertisement and they're all over the place therefore when you were a little kid um, you could send a dollar twenty-five to this address, and they would send you a monster-sized monster. They would send you a seven-foot-tall um, Frankenstein monster or a skeleton, so you yeah. could hang it up on your wall. And I read some blog posts and stuff, and people say it was printed on the garbage bag. It was kind of cheesy, but it was still technically a seven-foot-tall monster. So what I've been doing is I'm making my own seven-foot-tall monsters. Which <laughs> And I'm combining a lot of the themes of monsters and stuff from science fiction movies I love and basically making. Um, All right. It's like, um, uh, what's, what's the word in English? Uh, um, ah, let, me, let me try to, to Google that. Um, uh, it's called Shimmer in. Uh, Shimmer, yeah. Shimmer, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Shimmer. Indeed, that's, that's English. Yeah, so there's. That's um, the only reason I'm, I'm mentioning them is because like as I'm going through this process I'm trying to think like how can I make a comic book out of this how could I make something that people could buy for five dollars or get for free something cheap that like they'll have to collect yeah and um I that's what made me so intrigued about your your catalogs and those are those are gorgeous uh catalogs by the way Thank you. I, I, I'll send you to, I'll ship you some if you want to um yeah let's do an art trade they so the goal for these is i wanted to print them seven foot tall all around buffalo different kinds like you know lurking about and i want them to be 
kind of connected with a story, you know, mm-hmm. of what is going on. I'm going to make a portal that like opened up inside of a wall and like characters are going to be coming out and. But that's like installation. Yeah. It'd basically be like a mural. Um, there is, there's a place here. And I'm, I'm sure there's some in Brussels too, where you could, they basically, it's like uh, they print on outdoor proof, waterproof vinyl. Yeah. And it's like the same stuff they wrap vehicles with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, a, it's called lettering. Uh, type of paper. Yeah, I see. It's actually sometimes cheaper to print on this than to print on paper. Um, it's, it's, if you want like a big A0 printed, uh, full color printed, it, it costs more than PVC printing. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's quite insane, especially like for ecological reasons. It's not really cool, but yeah, yeah that's, that's cheaper. I'm hope so I'm hoping to get a few of these up and um, eventually dreaming big i was like well if they're really monsters i mean some monsters are like the size of king kong right Uh, like let's get a whole side of a an apartment building like a big uh transformer warrior or something like stomping through so you you can also try try them out by with a projector before like to see how big you want them uh, to be and and how they will look like um in, in 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 different environments you can just uh you know project them um that's a good idea just a laptop and your projector with some some juice and that's it that's a real good idea yeah i could kind of double check on the context and see where they fit that's awesome um what kind of comic books were you, were you into um growing up i really liked the fantastic four yeah. and then it but i was so young it was like whatever you know i could convince my dad to buy me at the flea market or my mom you know when we were at the shopping mall and occasionally like a real creepy weird one would get you know in the mix you know like yeah, sure. more gory ones and stuff and now that i'm an art educator i'm an elementary school art teacher i i look at these old comics some of them that i still have and i i could now know that i got my drawing and art vocabulary from them i would just stare i i didn't read a, probably a word of uh 90% of those comics, but I stared at them for hours yeah. looking at, you know, how they were all drawn, what they were doing, perspective, yeah. all of that stuff, stuff I didn't even know the words of when I was little. So it's been yeah, exciting. I, 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 I do remember purchasing or like getting my first Iron Man comic book before knowing how to read. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I, and these images are, are deep in my, in my brain. I mean, I remember like, uh, looking at them for hours without understanding anything about the story but yeah it was uh, i understand the feeling the you know it's funny to kind of come full circle back to your religious imagery um you know we look at certain myths i feel like the older the myths are the more that we all say oh this is clearly made up you know we think of like the greek and roman myths yeah, and cool. those are all myths and stories that lived in the hearts and minds of of people so to me in a way that they're they're real on some level on like almost like a magical or like a mystical level they're at least they're real as they are like stories and programming in in people's minds and the one thing that bakes my noodle is well all of these superheroes that someone like stan lee made these are on the movie screens and television screens of like seven billion people they're part of like the human story, you know, yeah. kids have them on their shirts. They want to be like them, you know, they're, they're gods in their own way, you know, yeah. well, the, in their own way. super, super humans. I mean, these are, <laughs> those, those are super humans. That's the idea that among, among us, there's a bunch of people with extra powers that are, that nobody has besides them. Um, it's mythology. It's, it's only that, um, you know, uh, you take I don't know Flash. He can he can he can run super fast. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that that existed before. Um, so mm. I, yeah, this the idea. I think Umberto Eco wrote, wrote a, a book about that. Um, from from Superman to ah, I forgot. It's been too long. But uh, the idea that yeah, they. Who is the author? Uh, Umberto Eco. He wrote uh, Foucault's uh, Pendulum, uh, The Name of the Rose. Um, 
Yeah, quite, quite. And it's it's a bit complex to read, and I'm, I don't oh. I don't say that in a snobbish way. But it basically it highlighted the fact that um, society is always needed, always had the need to put to be surrounded by these super uh, humans, these humans or you know semi gods who look like us, but they have something extra. Sure. Uh, yeah, we always it was some some always reassuring, and yeah, I'm. I, since I'm a kid, I always loved comic books and you know superhumans. That's that's a question we had in the in the playground. What kind of power would you like to have? Um, so, yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you before we we wrap things up is um what what's something that is there? What are you working on right now? Is there anything you'd like to share? Um, that uh, uh, are you cutting more holograms or? Uh, okay, world world preview. Um, I do have some like big lenticulars wow. I'm working on. Let me see if I can see that. Whoa. So um, let me see if I have like a light. Wow. Let's the depth see. on that is crazy. These are, you know, these are bigger. Um, let me see if you can see better. Yeah. yeah. These are more, like same type of uh, electron stuff, but on thicker lenticulars um, and bigger ones. So let's. That's the kind of stuff I'm working on, and um, also, I, uh, let's see. I, I received some requests for additional uh, lenticular pieces that have been traveling in Denver, and uh, wow. there might be some of them in Japan. I'm still waiting for confirmation, but yeah, that's that's the stuff I'm working on, and um, I've also made a quick series about. Um, um, you know, it's, it's more like a technical exercise. You can see some details about mm, epoxy yeah. resin that I use on mm. the on side. I, I try to mix uh, various elements into these, you know, iconographic kind of like religious boxes that you can find in some churches or some museums now. Yeah, uh, it's, it's more of a technical exercise that we like, you know, the challenge of making something super clean, super neat mm -hmm. using epoxy. Um, this is like, for instance, a, a detail of a Bosch painting mm -hmm. uh, with a um, uh, propaganda poster about uh, nuclear energy, the promotion of nuclear energy in China in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the kind of stuff. That's beautiful. I'm, uh, thank you. The kind of stuff I'm, I'm working on these days. Uh, but I try to slow down. I'm, I'm quite busy with work besides that. So um, I also need to find a new, uh, every, every, every series is a concept. There's a very big idea behind this, really like some message and symbolism. Um, and I try to have something ready before working on a new series. So before next year, I don't think I will produce very much. So is part of your process coming up with like a series or a theme and making yourself stick with it for a few months? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the that's my way of working. Um, Usually there's, there's a topic that I want to, to talk about um, or that I find interesting in some ways uh, that reflects some, you know, some contemporary issue that we, we're facing. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I build the idea in my head. It takes, it takes several months. And then uh, when, when I think it's ready, um, I start working on the, I do the execution. Let's say uh, there's a conceptualization and then the execution. I can think about stuff for months and I only start working on it. And in just a few weeks, everything is done. So I don't spend much time working on, on collage. Actually, uh, I said it before in, in, in another interview that I, I barely spend two months per year working on that. Uh, but I develop process in order to work faster and to produce more in less time. Uh, but yeah, there's always every, every, everything I, I make has must have a message, a symbol, uh, something that goes further than just the visual appearance. Uh, it's very important to me. Okay, I'm sure that's good for collectors too, right? They know what they're what they're talking, what they're getting, what they're looking at um, after they buy it, what they could tell their friends it's about, and they have they have the catalog to to exactly. go with. They buy a story. They 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 buy something that they like visually, but they buy. The story that goes with it, and uh, you know, it, it's important to have the to have something to say. Um, that's that's what I think. 
Um, and also because collectors, they need it. They need, they need something to grasp around, around the artwork. And I really don't want that to be about the artist uh, mm. or myself, especially. I want that to be about the message that is behind. Um, in, in, the, in, the, in the market, there's too much about who made it and not what was said. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you have this artist that is, I don't know, uh, any refugee from some, uh, from some country, that's already like a selling point. You know, if that guy comes from this horrible country and he's an artist. Mm -hmm. All right, that's, that's valuable already. Yeah, but what, what he's saying or what she's saying is more important uh, to me. Sure. So I, I think that's more important definitely for, for, uh, for the audience. I think it's important to have something to say. When those are all very insightful things to say, um, buying, buying a story. And that's, that's going to go in the, uh, the cut it out hall of fame. First entry, by the way. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, so I want to ask you one more thing about your, uh, series yeah. is, so I understand that you like, you're just like an author sometimes outlines everything to a detail before they start to write. You have your idea, your concept, a story. When it comes to the actual ex execution of the work and its size, do you say during you know this series uh, everything is going to be uh, 36 inches by 24 inches? Do you do you get down to that much detail where everything is going to be like one one size of the finished work? Most of the time, yes. Um, I I know exactly where I want to go. Um, that's where I, I differ maybe a bit from, from some colleges is that there's no trial else. I don't try stuff to see if it looks good. I just go straight to the point where I want to be. That's the, the point. I, I don't, it, again, I don't dedicate much time to, to, to this hobby. Um, so I need to work effectively. And when I start, sometimes I do sketches that are completely ridiculous, but it just, to remind me the ID and to where I want to go because I know precisely the, the, the final outcome. I know exactly what I want. Um, it helps me to save a lot of time. And uh, I, like, I like that. I think it's easier to produce, especially if you work in series. Um, you have a message, you have something to say. I say like, okay, I want to make 20 pieces for this series. For the other outcome, I made 50. Um, that was not expected, but yeah, it worked well. So I wanted to, to, to browse wide range of, um, of political and religious iconographies. I made 50 in that, in that frame, in that box, in that size, everything was very precise from the start. And that allowed me to work in three weeks instead of, of taking six months to, to produce the same. So yeah, I, I, I recommend, I, and I know it's not fun to, to, it's not fun for everyone because art is supposed to be fun. But yeah, actually, if you, if you, if you have a take of working when you make art and, you know, with a process, exactly when you work in an office job, if you just frame things uh, in a professional way, at the end, it helps making a better quality uh, of the work instead of just, you know, having a good moment. I understand that people do that. It's totally mm -hmm. fine. But me, I cannot work this way. I think work, the, the working process, uh, it's serious. It's not fun, but the outcome is uh, is of better quality. I think that's all all very solid advice. I recently read a quote that said, "You know, when an artist makes a schedule for themselves, which again sounds like the anti artist, doing it. when you make a schedule for yourself, then that frees you up for the actual like deep thinking that yeah. you want to be doing about your work. Instead of thinking, oh, when am I going to do my thing, or when is my next idea going to come, or whatever." You schedule, all right, my ideas and my work comes at nine o'clock every Thursday or whatever. Yeah. I think demystifying the process is very important. It's definitely helped yeah. me. Right, writers are doing that. You know, good writers write every day for a few hours. There's a schedule. Uh, I think you don't really need to stick to a schedule, but you need to stick to um, a result. You say, I want 20 pieces of that size. You already have guidelines and rails to in order to help you uh, move forward to results you like you can make 20 pieces and only like five of them but if you don't have these guidelines you may not have a single one that you like um, and they are all messy and different and you you switch id i think it's it's it helps that's my way of working uh, i know it's not it's not the, the best for everyone people like to have fun when they make art and i i admire that it's not my, my case at all 
But uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I like the idea that I have something good at the end. That's what I want. David, thank you so much for sharing all your awesome insights with us. My pleasure. Uh, thank you. Where could people go to find um, more about your artwork? Uh, is there anything you'd like to add or, or, or plug? Uh, well, you know, I, I do have a, I'm, I'm very traditional. I have a website, uh, davidconnell.com. Uh, as simple as that. It, it gathers pretty much everything. Uh, previous, previous all, all the different uh, series I, I worked on. I try to update stuff, but I'm not uh, I'm not too active on social media. I try to use Instagram um, as much as possible. But yeah, um, yeah, go to my website and you, you'll find me there. I'm, I'm on Twitter all the time also, but it's mostly to rant about the whole world. So yeah, that's uh, that's where I spend most of my time. Awesome. David, thanks so much. And um, I let's uh, let's set up that art trade uh, at some yes. point. And I'll keep an eye out for those big holographic posters for you. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye now. Bye.